Hello and welcome to the Cane Room. Today we are joined a man that has only been a one club man. He's made what for a total at the moment of 300, over 300 games for Charlton Athletic. We see him as really a club legend. Um, he's, he has enjoyed, enjoyed relegations, but he's also won the League One title and won the League One playoffs last year. If anyone has watched Netflix, <laughs> you'd see be, you see side beat Sunderland in that player final in the last minute to get them back to the championship under Lee Bowyer. As you can see, we are joined by Chris Solly. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. No worries, boys. Pleasure to be on here, mate. Uh, as as always, I'm joined by my co-host Jacob. Jacob, how are you, mate? I'm good. Cheers. How are you? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. Um, yeah, Chris, let's go right back to the start then. It all begun in 2009 for you. Um, Youth Academy, you, you kind of, you broke through. Um, yeah, let, let's start. What, what, made you get into, what made you get into football and, and, and why football? Um, from as young as I can remember, really, was football was always my, my passion, my favourite sport. Uh, from yeah, looking back four or five years old, that was all I ever wanted to do. Um, and then I must have been six when I joined my first local side, Cliff Woods. I'm sure, a few of the people watching, yeah, would have heard of them. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, played for them for two years. Uh, I was playing a year up at the time because I don't think there was an age group for, for my year group. So I was playing a year up, um, played a couple of years there, and then fortunately got scouted for Arsenal. So joined them when I was eight years old. Uh, me and another local lad, Jimmy Bottle. Both signed for them at the same time. Um, and then, yeah, I spent four years there, um, eights, nines, tens, elevens. And then at that age, they told me that they didn't think I'd be tall enough or strong enough. Um, so I was actually released. Um, it just happened to be at that time, uh, Cholton were looking for new lads at that age group. So I went across, played in a trial game on the Saturday. This is, I'd only been released probably a week or so from Arsenal. Went across, played in the trial game for Cholton. And then signed uh, on the Sunday. So about eight days after told, being told I was being released at Arsenal, I'd signed a new deal at Charlton. So Arsenal was my boy club, um, still support them to this day. Uh, so at the time, yeah, can, you can imagine I was heartbroken to be told that I was going to be released from there. But then to be picked up by a club like Charlton, who were a Premier League team as well, um, kind of bounced back straight away and. Uh, was happy. It was a local side. I think it was suited me mum and dad as well because the travelling was a lot going to and from Arsenal three, four times a week. Um, Charlton just being straight up the A2 was ideal. And yeah, coming through the academy and made it through to the first thing. Of course, you made your paper as well in the end of the 2019 at Norwich because uh, you came on quite early on in that game, didn't you, for the injured Darren Ward? Yeah. Um, what was it like earning the achievement of making your debut in a game which obviously for the team saw them relegated, but for yourself saw such a great achievement of making your debut? What was that like? Surely a strange feeling. Yeah, so I'd been obviously training in and around the first team for about maybe six months or so. Um, I picked up an injury at the back end of the season before, which kind of it killed me a little bit because two other lads made their debuts and I'd have been in with a sniff and making it back then. Uh, so, yeah, I've been travelling, been on the bench a few games, been 19th or 18th man, 19th man a lot, um, travelled all over the country. Um, and then it got to the last game of the season on the bench again, so I kind of didn't really feel like I was probably going to make my debut. Um, it's unlikely that they bring on a fullback in a game, especially last game of the season. There's normally a couple of younger strikers or wide men that they'd chuck on. Um, but, yeah, like you said, Waldy went down injured after, I think it was about five, six minutes. Um, from looking back, it's probably a good way it happens for your full debut where uh, you don't really get time to think about it. There's no pressure. I literally went down, manager turns around, he's like, Souls, you're coming on. I jump up, put my shirt on, I'm literally on the pitch 30 seconds later. So there's no time for nerves, no time for that overthinking things. Um, remember the game clearly, to be fair, 1-4-2. Um, we had already been reloaded, yeah, and I remember if we beat Norwich that day they came down with us mm. um, so yeah we beat them 4-2 so they come down with us strange feeling yeah because obviously the club was in a bad way 
just been relegated, fans all disappointed. But from me, like from a personal point of view, I was over the moon. Um, a lifelong dream to make my full debut in a here in the championship, and uh, yeah, it's a strange feeling, really. You must have thought as well, like you wouldn't wish injury on any of your teammates, but when an opportunity like like that arises, you must have thought at the time, like now, this to prove myself as well. What do you think? Sorry, it cut up a little bit then. What was that? I was just saying that you wouldn't wish injury on any of your teammates, but when an opportunity like that arises and you were obviously sat on the bench and you saw that, you must have thought, right, this is my opportunity now to shine. Oh, yeah, 100%. Look, I grafted and worked as hard as I could every day in training to try and get a game, but if that's the way it comes around, you see it all the time, someone gets their opportunity through an injury or a suspension, then you have to just make the most of it and... Um, it actually happened that day that Kelly Uga went to centre half and I come on at left back. Um, so it wasn't even a, the player in my position that gave me the opportunity, but it just worked that way. A centre half went down, and there was no left back on the bench. Kelly could move across and play centre half. So, yeah, sometimes just having that little bit of luck to get that opportunity, and then when you get that opportunity, making the most of it. You said that it wasn't your preferred position as well. Was was it a position that you were still familiar with though, or did you have to really adjust during the game? No, I played quite a lot of left back uh, in the reses, probably in that year leading up to it. Um, funnily enough, <clears throat> I didn't really play right back much in that year leading up to that game. Really, I played probably the majority of it left back and centre mid. Um, when you're a youngster in the reses there will always be lads that probably aren't starting for the first team but need minutes, so they'll end up playing in resi games. And uh, as a youngster, I just wanted to play wherever I could, wanted to try and get my, my name out there, show the first team manager what I could do, and I was happy to play wherever whatever position was available. Yeah. Have we lost him? Yeah. Can you hear him? <laughs> no, I haven't got him. Yeah. No, I can't hear him either, no. <laughs> oh, what a man. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah? yeah that's bad. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, um, yeah, first first start Football League trophy um, against Barnet. Um, I mean, yeah, when you got the when you got the call saying, saying you were starting, um, how did it feel? Um... I don't even really remember now, looking back, to be honest. I remember um, a blur. So it was Johnson's paint game, wasn't it? And, uh, yeah. yeah. I, remember, I think we won 4-1, was it? But I genuinely don't really remember the build-up to the game, really? anything like that. No, I know it's, uh, like, it goes down as your full debut and stuff like that, but for me, I wouldn't really count that. Like, unless it's a league game yeah. or an FA Cup game, I don't think it quite means the same and it takes a little bit of shine off yeah, I mean, you you finished in the playoffs that year. Um, I mean, kind of first taste of of, of being with a team um, that were kind of fighting success. What was it like trying to trying to kind of fight being being in and around that team, fighting fighting its way back to the championship? Yeah, so looking back now, like. The experience I gained from being involved in that squad it was unbelievable. Um, I was just a kid in awe of a lot of the players. Yeah. Um, but training with them every day, learning from them every day, um, some great characters as well involved in them squads. Um, and when I look back now, yeah, like you said, we lost in the semi-finals on penalties. Um, I was on the bench for the home and away game. Um, but being at the Valley in front of a packed crowd and being just involved in a game of that, stature was something I look back on I think that probably stood me in good stead um, and when I think back now with just being in that change room after the game looking around the dressing room and seeing grown men crying um, really? from how, how much it meant to them and how much how much it hurt losing um, it just put fire, more fire in my belly to want to do well and want to play for the club and get into the first team and get the club promoted but you know, you talk about their subs that it kind of was an eye opener that you look around the dressing room and you saw like teenagers and grown men kind of bawling their eyes out. Does it then hurt when, like, sometimes you'll see, and I'm not kind of aiming this at Charlton fans or any any fans, does, does it then yeah. hurt you to say that sometimes you'll see on social media that people will go out and say that footballers don't care? 
yeah, you, you'll get that in any walk of life, I think. But footballers are always going to be an easy target, yeah. um, especially the higher you go because the money, it is stupid money, but and they're always going to get criticised for that. But it's not their fault. No. Um, but, yeah, it's a difficult one, really. They're, they're an easy target. The media are always going to slate footballers. Um, and when you're in like normal scenarios, without sounding big-headed, 95 of grown men are jealous of footballers because... Like you say, when you grow up, everyone you wants want to be a footballer. <laughs> True. Everyone wants to be a footballer. Yeah. And uh, the lucky few that, that graft and make it to footballers are always going to be there to be knocked down and they're, all, they're easy targets. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, obviously, after the playoffs, um, Chris, Chris Powell didn't come in. Um, the season obviously didn't start awfully great. Um, in fact, I think during November, you correct me if I'm wrong here, um, you went 11 games without a win. Now, obviously, team has just missed out on the playoffs. Um, you, you, you then, uh, the, the fans are obviously upset as well. Yeah, yeah early yeah. first um, must have been around the January time or mid-season or whatever. Um, yeah. Team was struggling a little bit. I wasn't playing at the time. Um, I was injured when he first came in. Um, I remember he started really well. I think we won four on the bounce when he first took over. And then, like you say, yeah, we had a bad end to the season. But in a way, I think, if, if you'd asked him yourself, yeah, he'd probably say that looking back, it worked a treat because him and LD were able to go through the squad, pick who they wanted, any bad eggs or anything, anyone they didn't rate, anyone they didn't feel was on the same track as them. They kind of reshaped the whole squad that summer. Yeah, and taking over as well, it worked well. There were so many players out of, out of contract, so they was in a position to offer new deals who they wanted to keep, and anyone they didn't want to, it was an easy one. They just didn't offer them a new deal that summer. Um, so I think I might have played the probably about seven of the last nine or ten games that year. Um, it was the first time I'd ever started two games in a row when Paley come in. Um, I'd never really been given that opportunity before. Um, been in around the first team for a couple of years, but played games here and there, but never got a consistent run or a, or a fair crack at the whip, I'd say. Um, but then Pally come in, I played a few games here towards the end of that season. He obviously liked what he's seen. They offered me a new deal. Uh, so I came back for pre-season the following year, and there was, honestly, I want to say there was about six of us. Um, and I remember looking around thinking, wow, we are miles off here. Um, well, and six then, of you, six, uh, actual six first team players training. <laughs> yeah, so I looked, there was me, Scott Wagstaff, um, Johnny Jackson, and then there was a few others. Robbie Elliott was still there. Um, but yeah, honestly, it was bare bones. Wow. And then slowly but surely, every felt like every other day there would be another new sign in. Um, and then all together, they must have made about 17, 18 new signings. Yeah, 19 new squad, signings, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the squad uh, slowly but surely started to take shape. Um, we went away for pre-season out to Spain. And you slowly we started to get a feeling like we've got a good squad here. We kind of had the best players from all the other teams in League One that kind of haven't, hadn't achieved much. And they was all at good ages where they needed to prove a point. We had the likes of Royce Wiggins and Danny Hollands from Bournemouth. They had just lost out in the playoffs the year before, and they were probably their two standout players for them. We took um, Matty Taylor from Exeter, um, Dale Stevens from Oldham. So we signed a lot of good players. Michael Morrison, um, who knew the level, um, and Pally obviously knew what he was doing, and they were all top characters. So they come in, and honestly... So it must have been the first game of that, that season. We played Bournemouth at home, um, won three nil, battered them, played played really well. And I was driving home in the car with Robbie Elliott after the game, and he turned to me as like, "So is that this team will get promoted this season?" That was after ninety minutes. He called it, um, and you know, Robbie obviously left four games into the season, went to Newcastle, got his move there. Um, but yeah, it turned out that season we set all sorts of records and won it quite comfortably. Yeah, he did. Um, would you say that was a turning point as well during your season, or would you say there was another point in the season where you realised you were the real deal? Uh, so, yeah, we started really well, and obviously we was 
top two after about 10 games, I think. And we all started to have a little feeling like we're a strong side here, but still early days, anything having got 36 games to go. But yeah, I think it was around January, February. Um, we had some crucial games. Uh, the Sheffield games, obviously we played Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday away, beat them 1-0. Um, Jaffo scored a free kick. And then the following week, we had Sheffield United at home and beat them again 1-0. We scored another free kick. And them two were probably our biggest rivals at the time. And to go and get six points from them two games, I think that was when we all started to think, yeah, look, we're going to do it this year. Like, if we keep our heads down, keep working hard, keep doing what we're doing, we've got enough here. But at the same time, do you think as well, you, like Chris Powell had to do a job in sort of grounding you, saying, let's not carry it away, boys. Like, we need to actually finish the job before we can say we've achieved anything. He didn't really have to, to be honest, because, like I said, when he... When they recruited that summer, they recruited such good lads, such good characters. We never really spoke about it as players. Like, we weren't coming in after a game thinking we win six more, we're promoted or anything like that. It was just, right, we beat them, who we got next week, now we're trained properly. We had a laugh for, throughout the week and we had a great group of lads. Everyone would have a laugh together. But more so than anything, it was... We was just our heads were just so screwed on, and we knew exactly what we wanted to do, what we wanted to achieve, mm. and nothing was going to get in the way of, of us doing that. Yeah, I mean, that year um, you had two of the best forwards in that division. Were I mean, Bradley Wright Phillips had gone and scored twenty-two goals in forty-eight games. Obviously, Jan Komagut went and hit double figures as well. How instrumental were them two to, to 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 your success that that season? Yeah, um, I've said it a number of times. Probably for Jan was probably the best player I've played with in my career. He was probably in his prime, I'd say, as well when I got to play with him. So I was fortunate to play with him at his best. But he was unplayable on his day, and they linked up really well. Jan, big man, although he's led with his feet, uh, big man can hit it up to him. He'll win his fair share of headers, um, and then righty, obviously out and out goal scorer. So he fed off what Jan would feed him, and a. Uh, yeah, 22 goals. I'm sure it to himself, but he could have had more as well that season. We created a lot of chances for him. But, yeah, top player, both of them top players and a yeah, massive reason why we got promoted. But when I go through that whole squad, we had so many good players. that When you look back now, what other players have gone on to achieve from that team, um, it was no surprise, really, when I look back that we went on and won that league. When you yeah, I mean, look at... Um... The facts obviously picked up when you got right, whopping 100 million points. Would you say that's also uh, the, a reason why the club picked by managers? Because, of course, the season before, I believe you went 11 games that win, like James said earlier. Would you say that that's a reason, like, at that point, you could have, like, said, OK, maybe we need a change, but actually stick by the manager? I mean, it, it pays off in the end, didn't it? What, the year before when Pally took over, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think when, uh, when Pally took over, I think everyone was quite aware that the club was in a bit of a mess and needed a reshaping. And uh, he was the ideal man to do it. Um, he's probably up there. Off. I must have played under maybe 10 managers now at Cholton, but he, for me, is probably the best man manager that I've had. Um, I always think if, if there's players that haven't really played much under him, um, say they're on the bench majority of the season, but they still speak highly of the manager. I always think that says a lot about how the manager treats players, how he treats you just as human beings, not just footballers. And throughout that season, the starting eleven didn't change much at all. Uh, so there would have been similar lads that were on the bench most weeks. And if you speak to them lads, they've got, not got a bad word to say against Pali. And I think that speaks volumes about the sort of man management that that we had under Pally. Yeah, I mean, 101 points that year, Souls. I'm pretty sure it's still the European record now of in terms of points. Um, just going back to, to Chris, um, do you think that in terms of when managers walk into jobs and things like that, do you think, it's, do you think they, they then become more successful in terms of the way they treat players instead of showing how they are good tactically. So they could be the best in the world tactically, but if yeah. they don't treat players right, do you think that's 
aware that some successful managers are because are masters of their own downfall sometimes. Yeah, it's obviously about getting the balance right between the two, but I would say man management's more important than the tactical side. Because at whatever level you're managing at, even say at League One Championship, you're going to have good players. Um, you're going to have players who have done well to make it as a professional footballer, get to that level, make it into the championship or whatever, so be it. So I think it's managing them players and getting the best out of every individual is the toughest part. Um, everyone talks about tactics, setting up 4 4 2, 4 3 3, or whatever. But if the players don't work hard, graph for that manager, put in that extra bit of effort, you ain't going to get nowhere anyway. So for me as a manager, it's about treating the players right and getting the best out of everyone as individuals and as a team. I mean, that year was also good for you on a personal level. Um, you won Player of the Year and Young Player of the Year. Um, I mean, that was a nice way to top off a record-breaking season, wasn't it? Yeah, like, throughout the season, like, I, that never even crossed my mind once about winning any individual awards or anything like that. Honestly, it was all about getting promoted. And me personally, I just wanted to go as high as I could um, and play against the best players I can to test myself. Um, so, yeah, like I said, to round it off at the end of the season, to be voted player of the year, young player of the year, was just a dream season, really. It was my first full season of playing. And then to cap it off like that was just, yeah, an unbelievable feeling. And uh, you just went into that off-season. I didn't even need the off-season, really. I was just so looking forward to the following season, planning the championship and planning it to better players. And I always think as well, um, the winners in the championship compared to League One are a million miles because a lot of the players you'll either see have either played in the Prem and have dropped down or you'll see in the future will go on to play in the Prem. Yeah. Um, so that was what I was probably looking forward to the most and playing against a top calibre of winger. And yeah. uh, I was lucky enough to do that. You talk about that gap that, and there's a lot of talk between financial gap and there's, and, and once clubs move from League One to Championship, obviously you played in both. How, how, how big a gap do you think there is between that next step from League One to Championship? Do you think that it's, it is solely down to financial? or Because you've seen, obviously, clubs like yourself that have, have, have jumped from League One to Championship. You've seen then clubs from like Yeovil who have kind of gone from League One to Championship really really struggled then obviously now look at obviously look at them now they're now in the conference what do you think the distance is and what do you think clubs have to then do right to to make sure they maintain maintain there yeah from from league one to the championship is a big jump um like you say it is a completely different world financially um you've got teams coming down from the premiership um, getting their parachute money still paying premiership wages and then you've got teams coming up from League One in the contrast in wage is a million miles. And uh, don't get me wrong, but it's been tough this year, but it's no coincidence that the three teams in and around the bottom, us, um, Luton and Barnsley, we were the three standout teams in League One by quite a way, I'd say. I'd say there was yep. probably us three really add maybe Sunderland into that and Portsmouth, but us three were probably the best three teams in that league quite comfortably. And now we're struggling in the championship. It just goes to show the step up is huge. And then when you go up one more, I think it, obviously it's even bigger because the standard in the Premier League is relentless. Um, but you do get the odd occasion, like we've seen over the years, Southampton, Norwich, done, and Bournemouth done that. And how they've done that, once you do that step up and then you play on that level, is unbelievable what they do and probably doesn't get appreciated as much as it should. But... But yeah, finances play a huge part of that and that's why the step-ups are so big. Would you say you agree with the idea of parachute payments as well for these teams that have fallen out of the Premier League? It's a difficult one really, but in terms of teams being relegated from the Premier League down to the Championship, I think if they didn't have that parachute payment, I think that's financially they'd find it hard to survive. And yeah. when you do go up from the Championship to the Premier League, you have to inject that money to be able to compete. Yeah. Uh, I do think it is necessary, yeah. Obviously, the following year, um, good year for you again. 
really good year for you again. Um, in terms of the club and and yourself, um, player of the year, ninth as a, a ninth place finish back into the championship. Strong year on your part. Yeah, talk 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 about that year and 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 obviously ninth just missed out on the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, talk about that year. Yeah, so um, we started quite well again. I think first three games. Um, unbeaten, started well, and then yeah, we had our first loss. I think it was against Palace at home on Selly, and then we was up and down. Yeah, a few losses here, pick up, we pick up a win at home here and there. Um, but yeah, that was when we probably started to notice the jump up. Ten, fifteen games in, we settled into the league, um, and we, yeah, we had everything our own way the year before. Didn't really lose. Didn't really have to recover from any many setbacks. So it was a totally different feeling being in the championship. Um, but yeah, we stuck at it. Was in and around a relegation zone, just sitting above it. Um, and then we kind of got stronger into the second half of the season. And then I remember going into the back end last 15 games, started picking up quite a few wins. And then I think we must have won maybe six out of the last nine or something. And like I said, we went into that last weekend. Because the gaps were so big from like, say, seventh to... 16th. If you went on a run of one, three or four games, it put you up so many positions. And then we went into that last game with a sniff, went an outside chance of making the playoffs. It was mental, really, because throughout that season, we was nowhere near that. Um, but yeah, some of my most memorable games are probably in that season, um, games I look back on and really enjoyed. Um, the likes of Man, Brighton away, Cardiff away. Um, the away games I always enjoyed the most, really. Don't get me wrong, like once, when the Valley's packed out, it's an unbelievable atmosphere. And when you start applying pressure on the opposition and you get a corner or something and the fans get behind you, it is a buzz. But going to them away ground, grounds, like packed out, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000, um, kind of backs against the wall. No one really expected us to get a result there. And we always managed to dig out results when people least expected it. Um, so again, yeah, Cardiff for one, and playing against Bellamy down there and um, testing yourself against wingers like Lua Lua at Brighton, the Palace games, playing against Zaha and Balassi. I always enjoyed them games the most. Would you say as well you like thrive off of the like the opposition atmosphere as well when maybe like the opposition fans are getting on your back or whatever? Would you say that like, pushes you on more? Me personally, it does, and I love that. But I think as a club, we really took to that that season, like, we was under, no one really expected us to do much that season. And uh, like I said, we went to places away from home and pulled off some great results. Um, I remember beating Leicester home and away and no one gave us a, a chance against them. Um, so them sort of games, yeah, I think as a team, we always rose to the occasion. And uh, when we really needed to dig a result out, we always managed, found the way to, yeah, found the way to, to get them three points. Over those two years, um... Obviously, winning the league, finishing ninth back in the championship. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Sol. Um Any 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 stories that you can kind of say say on here that Charlton fans might might well enjoy that they maybe haven't heard before? It's kind of hard, really. Um, more so the year before, because obviously we've been promoted. So uh, when, when teams get promoted, obviously you go away together. So we went to Vegas. Um, the owners paid for the trip to Vegas. Like everyone went, staff. Um, must be 30 odd of us, but unreal three days. Uh, I'd just turned 21 that January before, so I just made the cut. <laughs> um, but just this, an image that I'll never, ever lose was um, we was in one nightclub, can't remember the name of it, and uh, our club doctor, um, he was 70 odd, um, and our club secretary. Um, he's still at the club now, so hopefully he don't need this. But uh, they was stood on the table in a nightclub, um, hands in the air, <laughs> absolutely having it, with a cigar in one hand, glow sticks <laughs> in the other. And uh, it's, we speak about it. Whenever I come back and meet the old lads from that trip, we always, everyone always remembers that. And it's an image I'll never lose. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, the following year, um, Quite a weird one, correct if I'm wrong. This was the year at the start of the three managers, wasn't it? Um, it was Guy losing, uh, 
Carol Fry and Jose Riga, was it? It was that year, wasn't it? I think that, that was the year up. Oh, no, it might have been. Yeah, yeah. it might have been, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah that year. Um, we Obviously, you spoke uh, after having two really, really good years. Um, I know as a player, obviously, you can't kind of talk about what goes off the field because the players don't know and don't really like to get involved. But what was it like trying to deal with so many managers in one season? Because that is quite unique, isn't it? Yeah, so I had actually struggled through that pre-season with an injury. And uh, I played the first game of the season. Uh, I think it was Bournemouth or something. And then I might have played the second game. And then I didn't actually play again until about Christmas. So I wasn't involved much at all. Um, so going to games and watching and seeing the team struggle was even harder. Because yeah. all you want to do is be out on that pitch. And any player would tell you there's nothing worse than being stuck in the stands watching a game if the team is struggling. So I actually um, kind of got rushed back a little bit around December time. Uh, come back, played three games in a week. Um, and we managed to pick up, I think, five points. Oh, the little boys come to see what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that got back in Christmas time. Played three games, but I was, still wasn't right. And then ended up... Stop touching that, mate. Ended up having to sit out again for about another three months. So there all the stuff that was going on off the pitch, I wasn't really... didn't really see much of it, to be honest. I was just cracking on with my rehab, trying to get on with things. Um, so then when... Obviously, the changeover of manager happened. Parley got sacked. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was the year, actually, wasn't it? So we had the good run in the FA Cup. That's what. I'm, so we had a good run in the FA Cup, and uh, it meant that we'd missed out on quite a few league games. Yeah. So we was about. I swear we had about three or four games in hand on everyone else, but we was in the relegation zone. We was only probably a point or two off safety with three or four games in hand. So the league table didn't. It wasn't actually as bad as it looked. Um, so we went into that FA Cup quarter-final game. Um, obviously, lost at Sheffield United in that game, and then Pally was sacked. Yeah, um, and then the new manager come in. So for me, I didn't really have much involvement with the new manager at first. Um, he didn't really speak too much to me because he had a lot on his plate. Obviously, coming in trying to find out what formula he was going to use, and then it wasn't until three or four weeks until the end of the season that. Uh, he come really and spoke to me, asked how I was getting on. I said to him, yeah, I'm not far from, from being back now. Um, and then it was a build-up to, I can't quite remember, was it Sheffield Wednesday maybe? I want to say Sheffield Daddy, Wednesday. You know where are you? Yeah, shush a minute. Um, I want to say Sheffield Wednesday. When uh, So he's told me on the Friday, I think it was, that, yeah, I'm chucking you straight back in, you're back in, you're starting. So I was like... After not speaking to you for about six months. <laughs> yeah, so he obviously had enough on his plate. Um, so I was just doing rehab, trying to get as fit as I can. And then, yes, yeah, so on the Friday, I think it was, he's told me you're starting tomorrow. Uh, Chef Wednesday away. Gone to the game, uh, warmed up as normal. Five minutes into the game, uh, we're one nil down. Um, and then not long after, we're 2 nil down. And I'm thinking, what's an absolute nightmare? I'm blowing out my arse thinking I'll match it when I'm miles off it and we're 2-0 down. Um, and then Marvin Sordell scored a hat-trick out of absolute nowhere, an unbelievable hat-trick as well. And we win the game 3-2. Um, and for me personally, like an unbelievable feeling to be back involved, to help the team get a win. Um, and a big, big, massive three points in a relegation battle. And then, I can't remember who the next game was, played in that and then we had Watford um, at home on the Tuesday night and if we won it confirmed safety um, I played in that game and we won 3-1 at home and then it confirmed safety so it was a terrible year for me personally um, I only playing probably I don't want to say about 8 games probably that's all I played that season but to be involved in the running in the higher pressure games at the end um kind of made up for it a little bit and it kind of eased well I'm not sure how to word it but kind of made me feel not as bad about the season as a whole and uh yeah so we we managed to stay up with one game to spare and uh that game I remember actually was Calamaria the young lad scored a hat-trick at Blackpool um but yeah it turned into a yeah crazy season but it worked out 
okay in the end and we managed to stay up. Of course, when you got like a long-term injury as well, and you mentioned that you didn't have too much interaction with the manager, like what sort of impact does that sort of have on you mentally when you're not playing, but you're still like having to watch on from the sidelines? Yeah, like, especially when you're younger. I think once you start to know the game a bit better and you've been around it a bit more, you probably don't take things to heart as much and you try not to overthink things. Like For me personally now, like, it wouldn't bother me one bit. But back then, it probably did a little bit when I think back. Um, probably thinking to myself, like, I've played the last two seasons near enough every game. Why has he not really said much to me? But as an injured lad, like, there's not much you can do to help, really. So that, when you think about it, really, what is that manager going to be talking to me every day? Why is he going to be speaking to me? He's got enough on his hands. He's coming to a team that's scrapping in a relegation battle. Um, he needs to find out what is his best team for the system he wants to play. Um, so, yeah, looking back now, like, I can see now, if I was if I was a manager personally, um, I think your priority is obviously getting results. So you've got to do what, what you think works. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously after the, after the kind of the free manager spell, um, it then... It then was then kind of Russell Slade for a little bit, and then Carl Robinson. Um, yeah, what was it's interesting about Carl because obviously he's he's had success um, elsewhere, uh, obviously at MK, um, and, and from to Charlton. What was Carl? What was Carl like to work with? So when he when he first got the job and it was announced, I was really excited to be working with him because I, when I, when we was in League One the previous time and I played against his MK Dons team a few times, I hated playing against them. Honestly, they were so good, like such a good footballing team, played out from the back, um, took risks playing out from the back, but always tried to play absolute soccer. And uh, I always hated playing against them, always. The possession, we used to back ourselves, especially that team when we won the league. We used to back ourselves to go anywhere and have the majority of the possession. But home and away that season, they battered us. Um, we drew one all away at their place and we beat them 2 0, I think, at home with two penalties. But they must have had about 75% possession. So when he came in, I was really excited, thinking, yeah, we're going to play absolute football. Um, didn't really know much about him, but excited to work with him. And uh, he came in. And I can't say a bad word about him, to be honest. Um, I know things didn't quite work out footballing-wise, but for me personally, loved working with him. Um, tactically, one of the best um, I've played under. So when you do that on a Friday, we might cover the opposition, um, do some analysis on them in the video in the, in the classroom. And uh, his speech is what he would do, pick out, he might pick out three or four points on their strengths and weaknesses, but the best I've seen. And uh, he used to come out of that meeting on the Friday thinking there's no way we can lose tomorrow if we do exactly what, what he's told us in there. Um, but yeah, we, the only thing, this is no disrespect to any forwards we had at the time, but and it probably because of the way we did play, but we kind of lacked a goal scorer, really. That's the one thing that we did lack. Someone who could notch 20, 25 goals in a season. Yeah. And uh, that was probably our... When, like, when we spoke earlier, we had Wrighty, Bradley Wright Phillips, who guaranteed you had 20 goals. And Jan guaranteed you 15, 20 goals. Plus, we had Jacko, who guaranteed probably 10, 15. So, we had the likes of Ricky Arms, who guaranteed us 10, 10, 15. But we never had that one striker who guaranteed 20, 25 and... That's probably what stopped us really being in that top six. You mentioned you like to be that, Jacob, wouldn't you? Being an Oxford fan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, one question I was going to ask as well, which seems to be a common theme with all the players which you've played under Farley, is how much they enjoyed playing under him. And like you mentioned, he was how good he was tactically. But what's the camera you like? I'd like, imagine that's quite good if he has a good reputation. Yeah, like, um, very close with the lads. Um, so, yeah, like, like I say, very close to the lads. Love the banter. Love the togetherness of the group. Always encourage that. Um, very easy going. Um, but if he wanted to switch, I've seen him switch a few times. Um, but, yeah, because <clears throat> he's a very young manager, isn't he? Coming to management very young. Yeah, so you yeah. can kind of tell that with him because he's still 
the age gap between players and him isn't huge. So he still relates a lot to, to, to lifestyles that, that all the lads live as well. Do you think that Just helps like, him? Yeah, massively. Like a couple of little things for me personally. Um, my missus was due um, for the fir- our first kid. And it, she was due on the, I think it was the Saturday when we had a game bolting away. And honestly, he was brilliant with me all week, asking how she was, checking out that everything's fine. Um, so obviously we'd always travel up on the Friday uh, the day before a game but he'd come and pulled me on the Thursday he was like don't travel up tomorrow um, stay at home make sure your missus are alright um, anything happens obviously you can't play that's fine just go and be there at the birth but if you can get the train up Saturday morning play the game and then we'll sort your train straight back after the game so it just happened um, <clears throat> nothing of that um, missus hadn't gone into labour or nothing like that so I got the train up first thing on the Saturday morning up to Bolton uh, similar sort of scenario again because we was one nil down after about three minutes when we had a player sent off. And in my head, I was, bothered. <laughs> uh, up at five o'clock this morning to come at here to do this, we're going to get battered. Um, and then we actually turned it around and one two one with ten men for eighty seven minutes. So it was one of them ones. Uh, quickly jogged off the pitch, um, got a quick shower, taxi waiting for me straight to the station, train home, and he had sorted that for me. Um, so just little things like that it makes you appreciate them a lot and uh, yeah luckily my missus didn't go into labour on Saturday either the baby didn't come till the Sunday so I've got home in time I mean um, unfortunately like you say um, Carl was eventually relieved of, relieved of his duties in the March but in come your current manager um, Lee Boya um, you then had an unbelievable run and managed to then get into the playoffs um, under him. Um, obviously, Lee had been had been a very good footballer, played at the highest level. Um, did you ever expect he was going to have that sort of impact um, as soon as he did, or did, did you know straight away as soon as you met him? No, so he had been working um, for a few months before, obviously, Robbo got sacked. Um, Robinson brought him in. Um, initially, I think it was just to work with the midfielders, uh, just to do maybe one day a week, uh, just a little bit of them. And he ended up, um, <laughs> then it turned into two days, and then it was three days. And then before you know it, it was his assistant manager. And uh, wow. it was him and Jacko, Johnny Jackson, was player coach as well. Um, so when Robinson did get sacked, I think, the majority of lads will agree with me. We assumed that Jacko was going to get the job. Um, really? Probably till the end of the season. Um, Why Jacko and not, and not Lee? Um, maybe just because he had been there a lot longer. He knew the club inside out. Um, it, was only going, it was only going to be like a, an eight-game period. Um, yeah, so we... I, 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 looking back now, I don't, at the time, I didn't even really think Bowes would want it. Um, I thought he'd just Jacko would be desperate for it. I knew he'd love that role. Um, I've played with him for a number of years, and I could tell years ago that he's made for management, and eventually he will go into it. But yeah, we come in and uh, they just announced yeah that uh, Bowie had got the, um, was going to take over. Um, so it was one of them ones where it was like right, we've got eight games to go. Let's crack on, see what we can do. Um, went on a good run, yeah, and snuck into the playoffs. Obviously, didn't go, didn't go away, but I don't think it's uh, any luck that, that we went into the house again this season and we handled it a lot better. Yeah. And uh, we managed to obviously go up here by the playoffs this year, last year, sorry. Did you say Bowyer as well had much of a different um, approach to management in general to Carl Robinson? I mean, it didn't seem like you took on <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be fair, like if you'll always see, or if you're an Opted fan, you'll know yourself, Robbo likes to play 4 2 3 1. And uh, we kind of stuck at that system um, no matter what, really. He uh, lived and died by it. And, uh, but I'd say the biggest difference with Bowes is last season we played every shape three or four times. Uh, we've changed shapes throughout. The... Sorry, two sets. That's all right, mate. Charlie, be quiet, please, mate. <laughs> 
the wonders we were, of being at home, eh, Souls? <laughs> three-year-old and a one-year-old driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I'd say the biggest difference with Bose is we we never had a set formula, really, shape-wise. Um, wow. We played so many different shapes. We played 4 4 2. He'd always try and get two strikers on the pitch. Love playing with two up top. So, it might be 4 4 2. We might play it as a diamond, a flat four. Um, we played 3 5 2 quite a bit. Um, that's a system that we've used a lot this season, 3 5 2. Um, so we was really flexible. We'd be playing games and um, we'd come in at half time thinking we're doing all right and he'd switch it up and be like, no, that ain't working. Change to this. We'd go out second half and we'd have more success doing that. So I think he's really good at, at seeing the game and changing, especially oh, mid-flower game. I don't know, mate. Um, trying to think of a couple of examples where here's so one example I'd say early doors last season um, something you'd never expect uh, we're playing Shrewsbury I think it was at home um, crap game one or half time not much going on uh, come in at half time change to a, a five at the back but I'm playing left of the three and Nabi Sarr who's left footed is playing right of the three so at first, I'm thinking, surely that's a mistake. Like, why am I playing on the left? I'm right footed. He's playing on the on the right, and he's left footed. But he was like, their biggest threat is their right winger who's left footed. All he wants to do is come on that left foot all day. So as soon as he comes inside, you, souls, you step in, deal with him, and then when you're stepping out of the ball, you can go either way. If you want to come inside, hit a diag, reverse it round. Nabby, you're good enough on the ball to do both. So you souls. So we're going to go like that. If you come out second half, just so happened, worked perfectly, um, ended up winning the game. It was a late winner as well, but ended up winning the game 2-1. Um, so, yeah, just an example of something where probably wouldn't think about it. And I'd say 99% of managers probably wouldn't even try it because it doesn't. if it doesn't come off, the fans are all going, he ain't got a clue. What's he doing putting a right foot on the left and left foot on the right? But that's the perfect um, example of knowing your players, isn't it? Yeah. And as a manager being probably brave enough to, yes. to just be, nah, sod it, like, I think that's going to work, so I'm doing that, and not worrying what anyone else is going to think or what sort of scrutiny you might get if it doesn't go right. Um, but we've done that loads of times last year. We'd, we'd play like crazy shapes sometimes. As players, we'd be thinking, I've never played this. And we're going into a game thinking, I wonder if this is going to work. And then 10 minutes into the game, we're maybe 1-0 up and the ball for 80% of the game, 80% possession um, so just another couple of shapes like we played four like I said we'd always try and get two up top and then it was ways of getting the best out of our footballing players um, and whatever shape that was we went to Portsmouth away once and we played a box so we played four at the back two sitters two tens and two up front um, and he he had obviously watched the opposition and felt that was the best way to hurt them. Wow! And of course, last year as well, the way you got probe was through the playoffs against Sunderland in the final as well. Oh you went into the changing room at one one all. What was what was the sort yeah, of yeah final half time, yeah. at that point as well? Um, it was one of them ones where obviously. <laughs> The start of the game is unforgettable and no one will ever forget that. But it was kind of one of them ones where we come in at one all, but because we had started so poorly and conceded such a freak goal, it felt like we had the upper hand. And uh, we was the one in the ascendancy after getting the equaliser. So it's one of them ones where it's just, well done, forget the start, back in the game now, one all, they're gone. We'll go on and win this game now. Um and I think we, everyone was very confident going into the game that we was going to win. I'm not, really? I spoke to Bose after the game. He was so confident we was going to win. He never actually obviously said that to us, like, like there's no way I can see he's losing. But he was very, very confident we was going to win. And uh, he just believed we was better than them. That's simple. And he knew that we'd perform on, on the day. Have you, have, you, have, you, have you seen that series? That Sunderland series? Yeah, I have actually. Uh, when it come on... Uh, I think everyone has, because what else is there to do in lockdown? But I watched it all in 
probably a day and a bit. Um, just banged for it. It comes to that game then. It comes to the end of the game. You knew obviously what was going to happen. Um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> as it, did you did you kind of sit how you how you're sitting now with a bit of smirk on your faces just to say, yeah, well I know what's coming here. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit disappointed. It only lasted about four or five minutes, didn't it? The actual final, because um, I had to check because I didn't. I wasn't sure if it was six or eight episodes. When it got to the end of the fifth, I looked and thought, "There's only one episode, and we've got about five or six games in the league to go, and all the playoffs." So I was thinking, "They ain't going to show much of this final, are they?" Oh, no. Oh, no. Do you blame them? <laughs> <laughs> no, they've done exactly the same. Can't see there being a third series, surely. Well. You never know, do you? Um, Obviously, we come on to the current season then. Bit of a weird one, obviously, because during this current situation. um, Like you said earlier, that kind of the bottom three, obviously, yourselves, Luton and Barnsley. Um, This current pandemic's probably come at the right time for you, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Especially if the league gets abandoned. (laughs) Uh, What's what's it kind of like being a a footballer, um, living in these these current times and things like that, it's, it's, it's obviously a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of them ones where we all just want to get back playing. Like We all can't wait to get back to training, but you've got to look at the bigger picture and the yeah. safety of the public is the main thing. Um, when I, Obviously, there's rumours going all over the place and I'll, I'll read them and keep up to date with most of what's being said, what could happen if we do this, if this happens, if this happens, but... Me, personally, I don't know how the league's going to continue and I can't see it being finished. Um, it just don't make sense. Like, it's not safe enough. Um, obviously, I see there maybe a slight chance that the Premier League gets finished just because of the money involved. But yeah. it shouldn't be judged on money and it shouldn't be based on money, any decisions made. But the money involved at that level is stupid. So it's going to come into effect, isn't it? Um, but from Championship down, I just... Me, personally, I can't see it being finished. Don't get me wrong, I want it to, and I hope football gets going straight away, and it'll be brilliant for all the public, because everyone loves football. Okay, Everyone loves it, and it'll be a big buzz for, for the public, really, to start seeing football again. Even if it's just on telly behind closed doors, it'll just give a little lift to everyone, but I'm just not sure how it can happen. Like, There's so many things that could go wrong and what happens once if one player gets tested positive from one player that's the point, out isn't it? and everyone else and there's just there's just too many things that could go wrong I don't see how it's fair to get it going that's the thing isn't it is that you read so much about it is that the Premier League and the EFL are putting are trying so many things to bring it back and that you're almost like I think I read one yesterday that um it, there was talk of not even it being 45 minutes a half. And, 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 and the, the point is, is that if you're actually trying to change the game to bring it back, what's the point of bringing it back? I know, yeah, exactly. You, now on your day, it, it just don't make sense. I think the hardest, play, the hardest thing for us as players now is we are running most days. Like we have a programme. We got sent a four-week programme from our club. Um, so we're running Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, tough runs wow. but it's mentally when you're running and there's no target or no no date that you're trying to aim the wall it's tough it's in my head some, like we've been doing this now for how many weeks it's been six weeks or whatever running four or five times a week six weeks and the longer it goes on you're more you're starting to think what am I running for at the minute like once I get a date in my head then you can work towards that date but right now I just don't see how how the league can be finished and I'm running every day Getting up at half seven, going up the field, running for an hour for what? <laughs> yeah. It looks like the best bet if we are to have any football played is, like, like you said, behind closed doors. How would you react to that if someone approached you and said, yes, this is how we're going to go forward? If, if that's what we got to do, play, play behind closed doors, that's what we got to do. It is what it is. Obviously, it'll be weird and it'll almost fall up like pre-season game. But, but if that's the only way that we can get football going again, then that's what we'll have to do. Um, like I said earlier, like especially for the public. Um, like I, myself, I'm still a massive fan. I'm a massive Arsenal fan. And uh, if the Premier League restarts and every game will be on telly, I'll be absolutely buzzing. And uh, it'll make lockdown a million times easier for me. And I'll enjoy just sitting in front of the telly and watching all the games. And uh, I'm sure that's probably 
99 percent of people who enjoy football will say the same i mean um yeah let's go back to current season with Charlton. um obviously it's been it's been kind of a tad disappointing um you're back in the championship obviously um yeah kind of how has it been because obviously we've seen in the press with it's really, really unfortunate that obviously the owner, the, the ownership of the club, um, they're, they're having they're having rows on the radio, um, <laughs> which <laughs> obviously isn't from a Charlton fan point of view and, and a club point of view. It's a little bit embarrassing, certainly when you, you as players are trying to focus on a relegation battle. Kind of at the moment, how how do you sum up kind of the whole situation, your season, and th- things like that at the moment? Um, from a footballing point of view, like we started really well this season, um, yeah. we're flying, but then we had a mental run of injuries. I don't want to use it as an excuse because we've got a good squad, but honestly, we had probably like 13, like between 10 and 13 players out at the same time. Wow. And then as soon as one player would come back, someone else would get an injury, or it was just a mad run. I've never seen anything like it. And, uh, like it's, it's re- relentless in this league, and you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. So being able to rotate and rest players here and there, um, we wasn't able to do that. Um, so the same boys were playing most games. Uh, we was losing, but only losing by the odd goal every week, and we was in games right until the last minute. So it was even more frustrating. It wasn't like we was going somewhere and losing three nil, four nil, and not in the game. It'd be a one nil or a two one a three two and we've come away like given everything but then like not getting no reward for it so it was even more frustrating um so yeah we we got through that period we started to pick up a few points here and there um really tight down the bottom now so these these last 10 games were going to be were going to be exciting like as players, I think it, I'd rather be playing probably in this than being stuck in 14 and going to places nothing to play for. Yeah, um, really? at least it's, yeah, at least it's pressure on the game. You're playing for something. Um, you get that buzz before the game, um, and you know how important it is. Um, I have no doubt we'd have stayed up this season, and we will stay up if the season restarts. Um, but yeah, what will be will be. Um, that's just a totally another subject. I don't know how they'll decide who's going to finish where or what's going to happen with if points they don't. Of games being mentioned, yeah, things like that. So, but, but no, there's not going to be a fair way. Someone's going to be disappointed no matter how yeah. they do it. And um, the problem is, if they then do points for games and things like that, there's going to be so many legal cases that, yeah. that are then put into the EFL that they've got just too much rubbish to deal with, unfortunately. Yeah, so, so if one. Say, for example, in the Prem. Oh, did she? Yes. <laughs> Say, for example, a t- one team goes down and they've played Man City twice, Chelsea twice, Arsenal twice, Liverpool twice, and the team above them has only played them all once. Like, that's not fair, is it? Like, there's not going to be a fair way of doing it. There's always going to be someone that we're feels are done by, um, but especially at the highest level because of the money involved. What a relegation could do for a club is, yeah, could kill them. Yeah, I mean, as well as a player, if one of the solutions turned out to be to play the remaining games later on in the year and then have a lack of a pre-season next year, is that something you'd take on board as a player? Yeah, it could be, but there's so many obstacles you know, overcome with that because there's so many lads, especially the lower down you go, that are out of contract on June the 30th. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So then that opens up another can of worms. What happens with all them lads? Does their contract get extended like automatically or there's going to have to be a set rule because teams with a bit of money will be able to renew certain players deals or what have you but teams in the same league who can't afford that it's not fair because you've changed the rules so you can't then have one team doing something and another team doing something else they've got to buy all so they're going to have to players, they? come up with a to make I mean, so it's, when you look at our situation, we probably automatically get extended. Mm-hmm. But if they don't, you've, got, you've lost five loans, and then you could potentially lose eight or ten players out of contract. So yeah. That's you're pretty much two thirds of your squad gone. Yeah. 
Do you think also this period as well would encourage sort of better sustainability on clubs that are like a deficit in the EFL, like for what they'd usually have financially? Do you think that'll encourage teams to like actually spend yeah, it? Yeah, you'd like to think so, but then... <laughs> on the other hand, there will be clubs out there that are running well and being run properly, but mm. they will be reliant on the income from gate receipts. And yeah. if there's no gate receipts, it's difficult for them to survive. And it's through no fault of their own. No, no one could have predicted this pandemic. No, the teams no. are running well and teams in League One, League Two, running really well. But obviously we'll need, the gate receipt could be, could be what, what they're relying on to get through month to month. And without that, they're screwed. And it's difficult then to punish them or say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Because no one could have predicted this coming. Let's speak about um, you then, obviously, I, I know, um, did a bit of coaching for you, Players Elite Academy. Um, yeah, you, you obviously yeah. set up your own academy with, with uh, Andrew Cross um, and, 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 and Robbie Elliott, um, being, being two of the directors. Um, yeah, how's it, how's it going? Um, I noticed that you, you went into partnership with another academy. Um, I think it might have been uh, last year, I think it was. Um, yeah. That, um, yeah. How? What? What's? Tell us a little bit about the academy. Um, what was the idea behind it? Where is it going? What's your? What's your future plans with it? Uh, so um, I got involved through Crofty. Really, he was the one who um, had the idea of setting it up. Um, wanted to do it with local lads. We all grew up in Medway area. Um, so yes, yeah, set it up. Um, very hands on from the start. Done a lot of it ourselves, the management side, the coaching side. Um, I always, I wasn't really sure whether coaching was going to be for me when I stopped playing until I started coaching the kids, and I absolutely loved it. Um, loved it a lot more than I ever thought I would, to be honest. Um, so yeah, went from there uh, doing soccer schools in the in the summer holidays and stuff like that, and then went obviously like you know into the evening sessions. Yes. Um, so yeah, going really well. We have maybe sixty kids over there um, most most Wednesdays. Um, loads of roads you can go down with it, and I'm excited to see where it goes. But me personally, I would take more of a back seat probably the last maybe three, four, or five months. Um, I had an, obviously another little one, little girl, um, and then just being in, involved in the season was so hectic. Um, do you want to ring long? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but something that, like I said, I probably didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I do. But the satisfaction you get from seeing the little ones improve uh, is a great feeling. In a selfish way, it makes you feel unbelievable. But then to see them improve and how good they feel about themselves is a great feeling. Um, so yeah, I've done my B license and I will go on to my A license next summer. Um, get that done and then. I don't know, maybe one day when I stop playing, that will be what I'll go into. But I'd just like to have as many doors to open, really. So I'll get as many qualifications as I can. Um, and then eventually, yeah, when I do stop playing, if that's what I want to go into, that's De what definitely I'll definitely start Yeah, I'd like to think so. That's all I've ever known. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of roles. That, there's a lot of roles within football that really interest me. And, the coaching side, obviously, and then there's like the scout inside. Um, I love watching football. Like some footballers will tell you, they don't watch football much. Um, like it's their job, um, so that's what they, that's why they do it. But I love football, and I if there's a game on telly, I'll watch it no matter what country it's in or who's playing. Um, my missus is non-stop moaning at me. She's saying, "Why are you watching this when you watched the same game yesterday?" So I'll watch like Super Sunday and then I'll watch Match of the Day 2 that night. She's like, you watched this three hours ago. I'm like, yeah, but I want to watch it again. Um, so, yeah, I'd imagine I'll stay in football some way, but, uh, yeah, I don't know what, what aspect I'll stay in. Um, so, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit now just to finish off. Um, yeah. Obviously, you've been a one-club man. Um, for obviously, just at Cholton. If you could pick... A six-a-side Cholton team, 
the players you've played with, yeah, who would you go for? Um, so in, I played with so many good keepers. Um, in goal, I'll go with. Don't watch me. I'll go Robbie Elliott in goal. Don't um, didn't play him in low because I was still a kid, and then when I broke into the team, he, he got his move to Newcastle. But unbelievable shot stopper. Um, massive character within the dressing room as well. Very vocal. Um, so I'll go Robbie. Um, two yeah. defenders. I'll go. Shush, mate. Two defenders. I'll go Joe Gomez. Yeah. Um, Daddy. He was a 16-year-old kid in a man's body. Um, honestly, huge, uh, so athletic, quick, strong. He was 16 years old, come over to pre-season with us that year and just fitted in straight away. Um, you could tell I, within 10 minutes of training with him that he was going to go on and be that like, top, top player. And uh, it don't surprise me one bit what he's doing. Um, full international, won a Champions League. Um, just about to win the Prem, probably, but yeah, top, top player. Um, was our um, left back for the year we got promoted in League One and um, the following year. Unfortunately, he had to retire early due to injuries, but unbelievable fullback, uh, fit as a fiddle, up and down. Probably the best crosser of a ball on the run that I've played with. It's difficult yeah. skill, and uh, he made it look easy. He used to get assists for fun. Uh, top lad as well, so I'll go Gomez and Royce as we back to uh, three in the middle. Uh, I'll go John Joe Shelby. Um, I uh, played with him obviously as a kid coming through. Um, can just control the game. Like, I, I know he's moved, he was more of a box to box back right then, but he could he could just get the ball at that quarterback position and ping it 60, 70 yards right on someone's toe, even like as a 14, 15 year old. Um, yeah, the best passer of a ball I've ever seen. And uh, like I said as well, like it was no surprise playing with him regularly as a kid that he would go on and have the career he's done and play it at the top level. Um, so I go John Joe. What's that for? Robbie, two defenders. Four, I've got two more, yeah? Um, need another midfielder, really. Yeah. It's a difficult one because I play with so many, I don't want to forget about them and leave them out. We're getting a few texts later. Um, I'll have to go with probably Dale Stevens. Um, so, come to us from Berry. Um, could see he was class like straight away. Um, Got a great way about him on the pitch, like does everything at his own pace almost, but no one could get near him. Um, very cultured, um, scored a couple of absolute worldies that season for us as well. And uh, went obviously left, went to Brighton, and I think it was the perfect club for him for the way he played. Um, Brighton, total football inside, and it suited him to a T. He was able to get that ball in the middle and just dictate it, dictate games for fun in the champ, got them, helped get them promoted to the Prem. And then he's done unbelievable in the Prem for the last three, four years or however long he's been playing. So I'll put him alongside him. And then up top, if I could only have one striker, I'd have to go Jan Koenigan, especially in a in a five or six side team because he can do everything. Um, can head That's it. Goal, big and powerful, isn't he? Yeah, absolute beast he was. Um, for, for someone so strong and good in the air, his feet were unreal. Um so it was a dream for a fullback because as soon as I got it and the touch at my feet, I was just looking for Yam, trying to find his feet, trying to hit him in his chest. Um, but a top player, um, like I said earlier, probably the best I played with and was lucky enough to play with him. Um, but yeah, brave. Everything you wanted in a footballer he had, really. We'd stay there with games and we won the up, five minutes left. The game was tight. He would just drop back into centre half and fit in between the centre between the two centre backs and just be heading everything away. Not for anyone telling him to do it, but he was so desperate to win, hated losing to anything. He would just want to get involved, drop back, help out, defend. Um, wow. so yeah, a dream to play with and a, a great teammate. Wow, perfect. I think that definitely wraps up this podcast very nicely. Um, 
as you can see, yeah, lockdown, lockdown's being kind to yourselves, isn't it? <laughs> um, but as as much as obviously you're missing the football, it's it's a perfect time to be with your family. Um, Chris has been fantastic on this week's podcast. Hoping we can get um, some more notable names. Um, keep subscribing to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on all our socials. Um, Jacob, thank, thanks for co-hosting as well, mate. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, Souls has been absolutely brilliant this afternoon. Yeah, um, we wish him all the best with Cholton, um, and uh, and hope obviously if the season doesn't doesn't continue that they can uh, they can they can do well in the championship next year. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, um, and you've been watching Inside the Change Room. Cheers, boy.